Okay, sure. I was a Warrant Officer 1, WO1 is the abbreviation, uh, 155 Assault Helicopter Company, uh, 10th Combat Aviation Battalion in, uh, in Vietnam. I was in Vietnam uh, March 69 through October 70. Okay. Okay. L long time ago, I grew up in Illinois, a uh, small town, grew up on a farm, small town boy. Went to college for two years, didn't care much, was just wasting my time. Uh, at that time, if you weren't a student, you were going to go in the military, you were going to be drafted. I didn't much care for the thought of walking through the forest, through the jungle. So I went and talked to the uh, recruiters. The Army was the only one I could fly for without a college degree, so there I was. I enlisted in the Army to be a helicopter pilot, managed to get through flight school, and went straight to Vietnam like all of us did. And at that time, um, you said you knew, you basically knew you were going to be drafted. Yep. Uh, so I assume you and your friends at that point, you're all in the same same boat. Yep. Uh, did, uh, did you have, you know, all your buddies, did they also enlist, or what, what was the consensus amongst you, the people you grew up with? Uh, in, in our small town, uh, I think... There were a few guys who went to Vietnam, not, not a ton of them, and I think most of them were drafted. Um, I can't offhand. Those are the only guys I can think of. They were drafted. Okay, so you enlisted. Yep. Um, uh, and then uh, d you knew at that point that uh, you were going to be a helicopter point pilot, or did that come uh, later? Uh, no, I knew I was going to flight school. As long as I didn't wash out, I was going to be a helicopter pilot. Okay, so where did you go? Where, where did all that happen? Uh, basic training uh, for helicopter pilots was uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. Uh, what an armpit. Uh, February and March of 68 uh, was miserable. It was just eight weeks of, of lousy weather and misery, basic training. But, I mean, you know, you can stand on your head for eight weeks if you have to. So got through it. Then we went for basic helicopter training at uh, Fort Walters, Texas, just west of Fort Worth. Spent uh, four months there, uh, managed to get through that. We started out with tiny helicopters. Uh, and uh, then after four months there, we went to Fort Rucker, Alabama for advanced training. We got some instrument training there. We all transitioned into Hueys. Uh, four months there, I graduated from flight school the day after Joe Namath won his Super Bowl and had uh, two weeks leave. And I actually got a little additional training. Um, most all of my classmates had two weeks leave and then they went right to Vietnam. I had an extra two weeks training, an extra two weeks leave. And so I followed them a month later. Okay, so, uh, so you had 10 total weeks of training, is that right? No. Uh, I, if I said weeks, then I was wrong. It was uh, four months of helicopter oh, oh, okay. training at Fort, at Fort Walters in Texas. Oh, okay. Four more months in Fort Rucker, Alabama. So okay, I ended so up... just over eight months. Yeah. Okay. Correct. So you're, I guess, tell me about, you know, when that's over and, and you're heading over to Vietnam and you feel prepared. I mean, that doesn't seem like a whole lot of preparation. Uh, well, we had two... Uh, essentially 200 hours of flight time in a helicopter. Uh, I could handle the helicopter, but uh, flying in combat, you know, I, I knew a whole bunch of other people had done it before, so I figured that I could do it. And actually, if you go to a Huey unit, there's two pilots in each one, and so you start out as a co-pilot. We call them Peter Pilot, and, and we laugh. For the first 30 days, you're, you're basically ballast. You know, you're there, and if something happens, maybe you can help out, maybe not, but uh, you're not much use for 30 days. And, and after you start to figure out what's going on, then you can start to learn. And uh, typically, after three months, maybe four months, typically as a co-pilot, then you move over and you, you become an aircraft commander and, and you're the guy who, uh, who's in charge of the helicopter. So, you know, it, it worked out. And 
this was what what time period are we looking at? Okay, I got to I I graduated flight school in January '69. Got some extra training. Got to Vietnam in March '69, and uh, my my year tour would have been up. I actually extended an extra six months so that I could get out of the army when I was done. So I spent 18 months in Vietnam. Okay. And what was, you know, prior to going over there, I guess, what was your, I guess, your understanding of what, what it was like over there? I, I really didn't, I had no idea what, what I, what to expect. Uh, I just, you know, I went to flight school because I didn't want to walk through the jungle, and uh, I, it sounded like a better deal to me. Right. And and again, you know, thousands of guys had done it before. I figure if if they can do it, I can do it. And the reality of it when you got there was it just beyond imagination? Was it pretty much what you expected you were walking into? I didn't really have any ex expectations, but. What I did was I kept my mouth shut and learned as much as I could and uh, you know, just soak in. There's just so much information there if, if you're open to it and, and willing to learn. A few guys went over thinking they knew it all and, and they had some issues, but uh, you know, I, I was there to learn and I, I think I did pretty well. So uh, give me a typical day or week when you're there what kind of uh, kind of flights are you going on what kind of support are you giving uh, early on when you first get there you're a Peter pilot and, and in our unit you're a Peter pilot and slick which is a, a transport helicopter okay. uh, carry supplies people troops uh, wh whatever and uh, and so you're going to the little fire bases a lot. Uh, typical day, we, we probably flew uh, on average six days a week, and then we'd, we'd get a day off occasionally. Um, once in a while, I don't know, fairly regularly, we had combat assault missions, which is two or three or four or more slick troop transport helicopters and a couple of gunships, and we would meet up with ground troops, pick them up, carry them into an unsecure area and you know they'd go out of the helicopters and look for the bad guys uh, some of those we got shot at those were those could be exciting missions uh, we didn't get shot at all the time uh, the more mundane missions were they we called it ash and trash the the routine resupply of there were just little fire bases and all over the place there fire bases uh, small special forces outposts uh, regional forces, you know, just lots and lots of stuff. A few courier missions, uh, some some convoy. Uh, if there was a road convoy, uh, they typically wanted a helicopter overhead watching out, and they'd be in radio contact. Um, lots of variety, lots of missions, lots of flight time, some long days. Typically, we didn't fly at night. We didn't, didn't have any night vision equipment. Uh, we went out when we had to, when it was an emergency, but uh, that wasn't, wasn't a normal thing. And so, like the, uh, the combat transport, the slicks, the, those are unarmed? Uh, a, a door gunner on each side had an M60 machine gun, okay. which is better than nothing. Uh, you know, it's, it certainly helps, but... Uh, uh, a lot of target there and, and not much defensive firepower. Uh, the gunships carried uh, rockets and uh, mini guns, which were Gatling guns. They fired a zillion, well, 6,000 rounds a minute, 4,000 or 6,000 rounds a minute. Uh, a lot of firepower. We always thought the bad guys would have second thoughts about shooting at a gunship because if they missed, uh, it could have been a bad day for them. They were less reluctant to shoot at slicks because the slicks didn't couldn't do a whole lot right. about it. And did those go out together, or would you go? Would a slick go out on its own? De depends on the mission. If it's just a nation trash to resupply a whole bunch of fire bases, the slicks would were single ship. Uh, if it was a combat assault, it would be however many slicks you needed to carry the troops and a pair of gunships to go along to cover them when they were going into the LZ. Okay, and now. 
in your in your write up that you sent me, um, your uh, and a lot of the terms to me, I get lost. Even reading Marvin's book. Sorry. Uh, well, no, that's fine. I mean, uh, it, it's real. Um, uh, you've spoken to Ken Moffat. Yes. Okay, Ken uh, is the one who told me, he said, hey, Marvin's book, boy, it just reads great, and this and that. I'm like, well, I'm not military, and I tend to get lost in uh, all the terminology. And uh, but So I may ask you some questions well, on that. But that's, a, well, if the book's already, but that's an excellent point. If, 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 that makes, if it's tough for you to read it that way, it's going to be tough for other people, too. It, it is. You, you can follow along. Um, uh, and I think the people who are interested in it are looking for that kind of... You know, yeah, right up. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what's a what's a falcon? A falcon. It was our call sign. Okay. Uh, each of the units had call signs. Our one five five assault helicopter company slicks were called stagecoach, and our and the gunships were falcons. So if you were talking to a falcon, it didn't matter what number. You knew it was a gunship. If you're talking to a stagecoach, you knew you were talking to a one five five slick. Okay. And other units. Ben Gay's unit was the 48th Assault Helicopter Company. The Jokers were their gunships, and uh, Blue Star were their slicks. Okay. So you could tell who you were talking to by the okay by the the name of it. All yep. right. And the the Chin, is it Chinook? Chinook. 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 Yep. That's okay. a Native American. Uh, for some reason, the Army named all of its helicopters Indian names. Okay. Chinook is uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, you mentioned here a, a freight train Chinook. What's okay, that? Okay, freight train was the call sign of the Chinook. Okay. Yeah, the Chinook unit, yeah. And what Chinook, about... Chinook is a big CH-47 helicopter. I don't know if you're familiar. They're a, a big, heavy... Right. Okay. And the Undertaker Cobra. Okay, again, a call sign. Undertaker is the call sign. Cobra is a, is a, a gunship. And uh, Undertaker is their call sign. Okay, all right. Uh, the other thing that was good for me to hear on the way out is uh, Al Dykes had uh, a uh, an audio tape. Yep. Um, have you heard that? Or, yes. Yeah. That yes. Was, that was great for me to hear. Yes. Uh, you know, hear everybody. Yep. That was good stuff. Right. Yeah. That was. I wish I had more of that. Boy, that'd be real. I. I that was riveting, and I was like, okay, well, but then listening to that, you know, I can only imagine. You know, when Al and Bill and anybody who's on there hears that, it must just transport you right back to that time. Yep. It's unbelievable. Yep. Um, okay, well, tell me a little bit about um, support of the fire bases. You know, I've, I've heard, or well, I've read a little bit so far about, uh, you know, the fire bases were set up to support the larger right. bases. Um, so, um, I mean, we're, we're going to eventually talk specifically about Kate, but... In general, um, how did you support the different fire bases? Uh, the the fire bases, as you said, were set up to support boot praying the camp the camp itself, and uh, just kind of an aside, the bad guys had had come across the border the year before and and laid siege to Ducklop, which was just north of boot praying, and. And we were getting a lot of intel in the, in the late summer of 69 that the bad guys were going to do it again. So the Army set up a bunch of small fire bases around Bu Prang so that when the enemy attacked Bu Prang, these small fire bases could uh, provide artillery support. Well, I don't know if they were bait or if somebody just wasn't thinking, but what happened was the, the small fire bases became the targets before Bu Prang. So what we did to support them, they were just, they were just hills. Um, the, the slick guys and the Chinooks would have put in troops, cut down trees, uh, dug bunkers, uh, dug firing pits, filled a zillion sandbags, uh, set up fire bases in various locations, and, and a lot of helicopter support uh, getting them in early on, there there wasn't any enemy activity, so the slicks and the chinooks, the chinooks would have been the ones that brought the tubes, the the one five fives and the one o five artillery pieces. Uh, the slicks brought in the men, uh, a lot of supplies, 
So it was just just a lot of helicopter support for the for the fire bases. So when they when they set up a fire base like that, uh, what you just described, how long does it take for them to you know chop down the trees and bring in everything and and get it set up? Oh, I'm probably not the best one to to answer that. I would guess oh uh, four days, but that's a guess. Oh, okay. So that's quick. I thought it'd be weeks, or uh, you know, I didn't know. No, they. Yeah, it's it's bare bones to to get it up and running, and and after that happens, then they start to make it better. But uh, you know, Reg Brockwell can tell you a lot better than I on that part. Okay, so I imagine during that time, then the enemy becomes aware this is happening, and they start to draw some attention. And so, is there support that way? So you know to keep the bad guys at bay so they can continue their work? Well, well, certainly part of, part of, uh, of establishing the fire bases, I hope, would have been uh, the, the defensive people on the fire bases sending out patrols to, so that they're aware of enemy, enemy activity and, and what they're looking for is an increase in the enemy activity uh, coming their way. Okay. And I, I, I understand some other guys are going to be better at, you know, talking about that. I, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about uh, your two stories that you, you sent me. Um, like, uh, walk me through, um, and you don't have to go into great detail, but walk, walk me through the, the emergency uh, resupply mission. Okay. Um, there had been a lot of activity at uh, in the Buprang area with all the fire bases, and, and Kate was getting hit the hardest. Um, we'd, we'd been flying out there and taking a lot of fire. We knew there were a lot of bad guys. We knew that Kate was in a hurt. And uh, late one night, uh, uh, they started gathering up pilots and crews at, uh, at Bami Tuat, where, where our unit was based. And they said, uh, you know, the, the Kate is, is really hurting. They're really low on ammo. They don't think they can make it. Uh, we're going to have to go out there tonight. So um, we, uh, we all, all the pilots got together in operations. Uh, the, our commanding officer, Dean Owen, led the briefing. Uh, he also led the flight. Uh, it was unusual in that uh, rather than a, a, a pilot and a co-pilot, uh, what the CO said was, uh, uh, you know, I'm taking you five ACs, senior guys. You guys pick another AC to go along with you. Uh, so it was 10 seasoned slick pilots. Um, gunships, we didn't have that many gunships. We didn't quite have that luxury. So we had our, our normal crews, the regular pilots and regular uh, co-pilots. Uh, but it was, uh, it was five slicks and... Uh, early on, they talked about doing sling loads for the slicks, and uh, nobody was very excited about what, that. What's that? Sling load is you, uh, uh, there's a hook underneath the, the belly of the helicopter, and then there's a long rope, I don't know how long it is, 100 feet maybe, and then the load is at the bottom of the, of the, the rope or cable, whatever it's called. And so you're, you're flying along and you've got this heavy thing, a hundred feet down below your helicopter and it might get swinging and your balance is is real flaky. So uh, fortunately for everybody that uh, that got nixed and and what they ended up doing was was putting the ammo in and then they had a, two special forces guys in each of the slicks and and when the when the helicopter got down low enough the special forces guys pushed the the ammo out the doors uh, and that's how they made the drop. And so how low is low enough? How low do you have to come in? Um, you'd have to talk to the slick guys about that. I would guess they got 10 feet, but uh, again, uh, you know, the, they're the ones that went down there. I was a gunship pilot. I got to okay. stay up high, and, and uh, I'm glad I was higher. <laughs> okay. And so the resupply consisted of? Of, uh, of what? what? What all were you bringing in? Resupply was, uh, was ammo. Uh, I think it was M60 ammo, M16 ammo, and carbine ammo. Three, diff three different kinds of ammo for three different weapons. Okay. And so how, how many slicks were involved? There were five slicks. Four of them had ammo, and, and one of them was empty. And, and that got everybody's attention because 
It's the only mission that I remember we in country that we had an empty slick. And the reason we had an empty slick was they figured somebody's going to go down. Uh, typically, when we went across the border, we, we had empty slicks with us because it was hot over there. But uh, like I say, this was the only one in country where we had a, we had a rescue slick along with us. So it was four slicks uh, carrying stuff that had to go down into the LZ, one stayed up high and uh, four gunships. Okay. And so could you, could you see what was going on on the ground when you, you okay, so you were... It was dead black. Okay. There were no lights at all. The only light that we saw was the strobe on the LZ. Okay. So how is that, and is that how the slicks would navigate? Yep. Just to, to yep. they would set a strobe and they would hone in on that? And, yep, okay. yep. We, fr from afar, we had a radio capability called FM, FM homing. FM radio, so we would call wherever we were going. In this case, LZ Kate, tell them to give us a give us a short count or a long count. Five, four, three, two, one, and we had a, a needle indicator that would tell us which way to fly to go to that transmitter. So that got us in the in the general area, and then the strobe light. Uh, we're looking for a strobe on the ground, okay. and it was bright, and we didn't have any trouble seeing it except we saw it kind of late, so we were flying it out at altitude and we had to do a 360 degree circle over the LZ before we went in. So, uh, and that's where you said it. That wasn't the ideal. Yeah, no, no element of surprise <laughs> any longer. Not at all. Okay, so it was, it was obvious, uh, like you said, with the, with the empty slick and uh, I, I imagine by the, the we, level of the senior uh, that and and we'd all been out there. We we knew that it was exciting during the daytime, and you know we we knew it was a bad situation. Okay, and so then, uh, but th tell me what actually happened because it seems like you guys were surprised when you got there. <laughs> it was a piece of cake. We we went out. We uh, uh, we just we just flew out at altitude. It was it was dark. It was clear. Fortunately, the weather wasn't a factor, but it was dark. I mean, it's, there are no lights at all out there, none. Mm -hmm. So, I, I don't remember moonlight. I guess we had a little bit of. We must have had a little bit of a horizon, but we flew out at altitude. Uh, Lead was talking to uh, to LZ Kate, probably Albrecht. Um, and uh, picked up the strobe, uh, made a 360, set himself up, told us where he was gonna, where he was gonna go in. So, so he, we knew which slick he was. So we had a, a team of gunships on the right side and a team of gunships on the left side, and and we flew down behind him, so that if if uh, if he took any fire, we would be able to shoot our rockets and miniguns at the source of the fire. And, uh, and as the slicks kept going down, uh, we would do racetrack patterns. So there was always what we tried to do. There were four gunships. Two would be inbound. Two would be going outbound to come around and turn again with the next slick, turn in again with the next slick. Okay. But it just a uh, piece of cake. So how long did this whole process, once you arrived at Cape, to, for all the slicks to get in and out? Um, from the time that we started the 360 until we were out, I'm gonna guess was three minutes. Oh, wow, okay, so that's pretty fast. It went quick, yeah. Okay, um, and who else was involved? Um, I guess you know a few of the guys I'm gonna talk to. Who else was in on that? Um, was Ken Donovan was? Ken Donovan was chalk four. Yeah, he was the last one into the LZ. Uh, Major Dean Owen was flight lead. He was the CO. Jim Abbott, who I showed you his picture, he was he was the AC of the of the lead slick. He was one of our senior guys. That's why he was in the lead. Um, uh, there were let's see, John Ahern wasn't on that flight. Um, a bunch of just a bunch of one five five guys. And did you tell me what AC is? Uh, AC is aircraft commander, sorry. Okay. Aircraft commander is the guy in charge of the helicopter and the co-pilot or the Peter pilot is the guy in the other seat. Okay. And then I, uh, Huey's had a crew of four, AC, Peter pilot, crew chief, and door gunner. And actually in flight, both of those were door gunners. Uh, once they got on the ground, the crew chief had the mechanical expertise to 
do some work on the helicopter. Okay. So it was a crew of four. Now this was, was dark. Had you flown any resupply missions to Kate uh, during the day? I, yes, I, I did. Uh, one or two days before I, I was out there, I got called out there. It was actually the day that the Joker got shot down. We, we were on a different mission. We got called down there, and that was the day one of our assignments was to take the two Chinooks into Kate. And so I was talking to the, the forward air controller. We were getting set up, and, and we joined up with the, slick, uh, with the, the Chinooks. And so we were all set, and it just so happened that there were two Cobra helicopters, and they were on the other side as, as we were taking them in. So what we did is we knew there were bad guys, so we'd, we would shoot rockets under and to the side of the helicopters as they were going in. So the first Chinook was going in, and the, the Cobras were on one side, and we were on the other, and we were both firing rockets and keeping the bad guys' heads down. And, and so the first... Chinook got in fine, and then the second one, we turned around to come out and get ready to bring the second one in, and, but the, uh, the Cobras were out of ammo, and so it was only our two, uh, two Hueys, and we didn't have enough armament, and the, the second Chinook uh, took a number of hits on that round, um, but, but he got out okay. Okay. In fact, uh, I, yeah, that was when my, my helicopter got hit also on that... Uh, when we were taking the second one in, but we, we were fine. Okay. And so I guess, can you give me, you know, that bird's eye view of, of Kate? You know, I've read some different recollections that it was, you know, pretty destroyed and, you know, pretty beat up. I mean, any, anything that stands out to you? Not, or? not really. No. I mean, that's, you know, that wasn't a focal point of mine. It was, mm -hmm. it was just kind of a red spot on the top of a hill. I'm, I'm, I'm looking around, probably not able to see any bad guys because it's all tall, tall forest. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I know it's there and that's fine. I'm looking other places. Right, right. Okay. Um, and this, this other, this other, um, the three page, the night mission. The, uh, the medevac, uh, yeah. Walk me through that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. That was, uh, uh, the medevac were, were Huey helicopters that were unarmed. They had big red crosses. Uh, the thought was that the bad guys wouldn't shoot at them, but they did. And so when, when the medevac helicopters had missions that uh, in areas that were questionable or they knew they were hot, gunships went with them to cover them. So we, we flew out one night. Uh, well, it was actually early evening, I guess, but it was dark. And, and we got to Kate, and there was ground fog out there, and uh, it took them a while to get the, the wounded in. I think one of, one of their people had been wounded at a listening post, which was out away, and they were having to bring him back into the main fire base to, to get him evacuated. So we hung around a while, and, and finally they were ready. And so, uh, again, it was a strobe light, but, but with the ground fog... I, I told the, the dust off pilot, I said, you know, there's not much we can do for you. He said, oh, we'll go down, we'll, we'll see what happens. So he hovered down the strobe light that was, you know, in the fog. And just amazing what those guys did. He, he got them all out. Uh, they heard some mortar rounds leave the tubes while he was on the ground. So he, he got out before the rounds hit. And... Uh, just amazing the job they did for us for us gunships we we couldn't see anything couldn't do anything it was just a flight in the night going out there and coming back so you were you were blind in the fog and he no we were, we were above the fog oh, okay. but we couldn't see the through the fog we couldn't see anything on the ground okay we were above but the fog you could hear the the mortar fire uh, uh, we couldn't you could okay. but but the guys on the ground heard the the call it leaving the tubes. There's, okay. a, there's a definite thump mm -hmm. that if, if you know what you're listening for, you know what it is when you hear that. Okay. And then there's three, four, five seconds where, where it's making its arc and before it's impact. And so you, you got some, some warning with a mortar if you hear it leave the tube. Okay. And dust off, that's a medevac? Dust off is medevac, right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Used interchangeably. Okay. Um, and... I guess when you did the the uh, emergency resupply to Kate, 
what what day was that? Do you was that uh, just the day before the escape and evasion? Uh, I'd have to look. I think that was the morning of the first of November, but I'm, okay. I'm not sure. Okay. So were you then? Uh, were you aware? Uh, you know, that next day or the coming days of how that had deteriorated that situation there. I think I mentioned we were we were on a different mission at that time. We we happened to get pulled off on the uh, to come down the day the Joker got shut shot down. I, I think we were the replacement gun team. We were on the we were on the Cambodia mission at that point. So we were basically sitting north of Bami Tuat in support of LERP teams in Cambodia. Uh, the night missions, those were ours because it was RAO. We, the night mission, the night Cambodia mission was, we, they didn't need helicopters at night, so that's why we flew at the night. But after, after the night mission, then we went back to the Cambodia mission, so we were sitting waiting to see if anything happened across the border with the LERP teams, long range recon patrol teams over there, six man okay. teams. Um, so after the night mission, I wasn't involved anymore. I do remember coming back one evening from our mission. And we'd go into op operations and fill out our paperwork, whatever. And one, one of the, somebody told me, he said, they had to E&E &E from LZ Kate. E&E &E is evade and evacuate. That meant they were walking out. And I, I very distinctly remember thinking to myself, boy, we'll be lucky if we ever see any of those guys alive. And uh, just, I, I don't know, at some point later I heard that almost all of them got out and I was very surprised. Right. Is that, did, as far as you're aware, I mean, was that what happened at Kate pretty typical of what happened at the fire bases, them being overrun, or was that something unique? No, that, that was unique. Somebody fortunately figured out hey, if this happens at Kate, uh, it's going to happen at some of the others next. They're gonna, so um, the other fire bases got evacuated. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what order, but, uh, but the other fire bases were evacuated before they got surrounded. Okay, all right. So uh, Kate was the only one that suffered that fate. Correct. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, I think that's all I have for you. Okay. Um, did you did you ever meet um, the guys uh, who who were on Kate? Nope. No. Okay. One one of the things about us helicopter guys is, uh, at least for me, I've always kind of wondered and and I enjoy talking with the guys that we supported because you know they were the reason that we were there. Um, Hoping that we did a good job for them, the artillery, the special forces, the infantry. Um, but no, we we never met. Uh, one of the other guys who was out there a lot was uh, was one of the fax forward air controllers. He flew a little Cessna bird dog, uh, John Strange. Um, I did meet him a few times. We talk, but uh, no, never met any of the any of the ground guys. I would like to. Yeah, because that's what struck me as I was listening to Al's tape, you know, to hear Bill on the ground and Al in the spooky, you know, hear these guys, you know, Bill's thrilled every day, that yep. he's, you know, each night that they were flying. Yep. And, you know, have, has no idea who the guy is. But right. But you can tell there's a relationship building there. Absolutely. But uh, then you never see the guy. Yeah, that's uh, with with the helicopter guys. There, there is some of that. It's uh, helicopter guys and ground guys uh, meeting up, who however many years later and uh, shaking hands. That's a good thing. So, what do you? What did you come back to? What did when did when you came back? What was life like, and what did you get into? Well, like like I said, I stayed in Vietnam an extra six months. So when I came back, I was done with the army, and uh, that's you know, the army wasn't wasn't for me. I went back, finished my college, um, used every cent of the GI Bill, and when that ran out, I, I got a job working for the government. And they kept paying me every two weeks, so I stayed on, and uh, some years back I took early retirement, and life has been good. Uh, one of the main 
points uh, that we're talking to some people about uh, in in relationship to CAPE is the the term Vietnamization, um, where you know uh, I guess the war is basically being handed back off to the the yep. South Vietnamese Army. Yep. Um, I mean, do you? I guess do you have anything to to add on that discussion? It seems like they Kate was kind of caught in the middle, where they they didn't really have a lot of support, yep. and I don't know if that was typical of, you know, what was happening in the area or you know. Uh, yeah, Vietnamese uh, Vietnamization. Uh, yeah, that was uh, the hope that was going to get us a an honorable withdrawal, and it did. Uh, um, you know, we we were on the wrong side. We we picked the wrong side in that war. We sh we shouldn't have been there. It, it was never going to work. We couldn't couldn't ever give them enough guns, enough helicopters. We were just on the wrong side. There was just so much corruption on the, in South Vietnam. But yeah, we uh, later in my tour, I worked with the with Vietnamese helicopter pilots. They'd come to the U.S. and gone through the same flight school I went through. Uh, worked with flights of uh, Vietnam helicopter pilots. Um, uh, when I was in uh, in Bami Tuat, virtually all of the ground troops in that area were were Vietnamese. There were none of the big army units. Um, I don't know what uh, I don't know what else to say. Sure. No, that's fine. You haven't uh, made any trips back to visit. I have. have. Oh, I have. I've been back. Uh, I took a bicycle trip uh, in North Vietnam. Went to Hanoi and and Haiphong and some of the the outer areas. And then uh, when I really went back, I went back with uh, four helicopter buddies. Uh, we we essentially rented a van and drove all over the area where we had flown. Wow. Uh, we did go back to Bami Tuat, uh, Nha Trang, some of the other cities. Da Lot is a very nice city. We played golf. That was kind of interesting. So are a lot of these, I mean, like you said, you went back to uh, Bami Tuat. I mean, is what's still there? Uh, Bami Tuat is a thriving city, which was, which was really good to see. It's, it's the, the capital of their coffee industry. Vietnam's the second leading coffee exporter in the world. Uh, just really fun going back, really good. The people were extremely friendly. We were all a little nervous. Yeah, I was going to ask how you were received. We were received well, very friendly, no hard feelings. Um, the, the one I love to tell about, we, we sat down in a restaurant and the lady talked to our guide, the lady owner talked to our guide and found out we had been helicopter pilots. And she came out, uh, she went back and she got a newspaper and came out and showed us a picture. She was a VC and she's getting a medal from the VC. Oh, and so, really? you know, wow. we smiled and, and like that. And she went back and then she came back and she had on a, a bamboo hat with her medals on her dress and she wanted to take her picture with all of us with her, oh, with yeah. her medals and stuff, and right. uh, and it was just, it was just so good. The people are really industrious, hardworking, friendly, no bad feelings. And our guide said, you know, hey, the war to us, the American war, which is what they call it, not a big deal because we only fought you for 15 years. We'd been fighting the Chinese and and whoever for you know thousands of years. Right. So just no hard feelings at all. Uh, just loved going back. Hopefully I'll do it again. Wow, that's interesting because I actually considered going there mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. and seeing, but I didn't know what I could see or who I could talk to. And I know they, they I, fought with a lot of the indigenous people there who I think are not treated very well to this day, so I didn't know how popular that would be. There are still issues with the, the mountain yards, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, one of our guys is, is active in, in that, uh, and yeah, v pretty similar to, to the American Indians in our right, country, the, the Native right. Americans, yeah, just looked down upon, ill-treated, um, I'd like to think that they're mainly being left alone nowadays, but I'm not sure of that. I found a group who is trying to protect them, and uh, it was actually based here in Virginia. I think it was in Virginia. But anyway, uh, there's a group in South Carolina 
and I was trying so hard because they had said some of the Montagnard, the ex-soldiers had come over to the United States, and I yep. wanted to speak to a couple of yep. them, yep. Uh, but I, you know, I never did get a uh, response to that they found anybody, so hmm. that, that would still be, that'd be interesting. Yes, it would. Because, I mean, it, everybody I've talked to, Bill and that, they have pretty high regard for them, you know. Those people, alongside them. they did. They fought hard. Uh, they did not get along with the Vietnamese. It didn't matter to them whether they were north or south. They didn't like either of them. Mm -hmm. And the, the feelings were reciprocated. Uh, yeah. And, and we used them, abused them, and abandoned them, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's just another of the sad things that happened right. over there. Well, anything else that I may not have asked you that you wanted to let be known about this? The only the only thing that sticks out to me is I just I can't say enough about Dino and he uh, he was a CO. He didn't fly every day. He was a pilot, but uh, when when that night mission came up, he knew it was going to be a tough one, and uh, he he led his men, which is uh, I just can't say enough about him.